Hey everyone, welcome to Taking the Pulse, a healthcare and life sciences podcast. I am Heather Hoops Matthews here in the studio today with Matthew Roberts, Nexon Pruitt Healthcare Attorney. Matthew, good to see you. Good to see you. And welcome back, Peter Leventis. Glad to be here. It's so nice to see you again. Peter, for those of you who may not joined our first session with him, is the CEO of the Community Integrated Management Services, or we call it in-house SIMS, and and I know um, your colleagues do as well. It's an independent practice association made up of 14 federally qualified health centers, known as FQHCs. These centers provide patient-centered primary, dental, and behavioral health care to more than 350,000 patients across 41 of 46 counties. You're almost covering the entire state. And Peter, I hear it's the 15th anniversary. It is our 15th year, actually January the 21st. January the 21st. What are some highlights from those past 15 years? You know, we were, it came up with the notion that if we joined together, we could do a better job of transitioning to value-based care as opposed to the fee-for-service based care so that patients uh, were seen you know when they needed it or mainly for preventive health uh, needs so that we perhaps could reduce the number of sick visits they might have Mm -hmm. so we wanted to transition from uh, episodic care uh, to value-based care and uh, and the reason we wanted to do it is we had a finite number of physicians finite number of staff Uh, an infinite number of patients Mm -hmm. and so we had to do a better job of being effective with the use of our resources and that's true all over healthcare and that transition to value base was an initiative that came out by the federal government uh, years ago which is why we started the company because we thought that by 2017 they would all make the transition Mm -hmm. to value based care and that was the goal actually at the federal level but as 2017 came around um, you know the goal was pushed out a little further but we never we never strayed from that goal and objective because we thought that was the best way for us to be able to meet the needs of the patients we had you were ready so we did so Peter uh, Sims is very unique across the country and obviously within the state, but, and you had the vision back 15 years ago and came to us and talked about it and, and your leadership has proven to be extremely successful. But where are we today on that shift from volume-based to value-based, not only within Sims, but in the market? Because you guys were a trailblazer on this, but it seems like the market still hasn't caught up with, with what you're doing. No, the market hasn't caught up because the hospitals aren't there yet. When the hospitals get there, um, more practices, you know, will transition to it. A lot of practices have focused on value-based care, uh, which is a function of, uh, you know, a triple aim program, which is see the the patient for the right reason at the right time, and, and you'll probably be able to deliver care to more of the patients who have the greatest needs. Uh, more timely Uh, and we were able to do it now what could make it all happen quickly is if the hospitals truly embrace that notion too because hospitals have since established their own primary care networks too they have a lot of practices they own and they do a great job I mean every provider in this we don't have enough providers in the state of South Carolina but uh, every provider out here is doing the best they can to take care of the patients who present to them Um, Our role is a little different. Uh, In my private practice roles before for-profit role, uh, you know, we we saw patients who were paying patients, had insurance coverage and things. We did have about never more than 12% of our practice could be in Medicare, Medicaid, and uncompensated care. Um, In our world, and in most private practices world today, probably have about 30 percent of your practice is uncompensated care and then you have a percent of your practice Medicare Medicaid commercial marketplace you know all these other lines of payments so uh, we needed to do a better job uh, and maximize our performances and uh, and the first thing we concentrated on with Matthew's help was uh, the organizational structure so that we could you know do what we wanted to do was one, uh, raise the value 
um, of the physician's contribution. And then, and when I say physicians, I'm going to start replacing physician with providers during this podcast because we have nurse practitioners, PAs, we have dentists, we have PharmDs, we also have specialists, endocrinologists, dermatologists, right. and ophthalmologists uh, because uh, those are in short supply in some areas. Um, so we refer to all of the, and behavioral health specialists, which is huge now for us. Um, so we refer to all of them as providers. Um, so we offer a good opportunity because we have um, 128 sites now. We have each one of our major centers um, has a very large um, multi-interdisciplinary structure and then we have clinics all around the state uh, you know that uh, that are subordinate to the centers um, who take care of the patients in some of the more rural areas and it's worked very well for us. We offer new providers the opportunity, especially those uh, new res you know, residents who right. finished and they're coming out for their first assignments, to be able to practice in a multi-interdisciplinary environment where you're right there, an office away from you know, the most experienced providers in our network and others. And, and so no one has to be uh, left alone in a practice. We also cross cover and we do all of that. I know a question down the road is going to be about uh, how do we do um, during COVID and coming out of it. You know, we lost some providers to it because they wanted to go after it, after it lasted more than a year. They needed to go home to their home states to take care of their families. And, and really, as surprising as it sounds, we gained about the same number of providers who did the same thing, left other states, and they're here. from South Carolina, and they came yeah. back here. So we almost had a one-for-one one on the providers. Where we saw the biggest transition is in the nursing staff and, uh, you know, the ancillary support staff as well. Um, people just couldn't afford to, you know, to uh, they couldn't even find uh, daycares and things like that open for their children, and so they were making choices about going to work or or what leaving the children with people they weren't comfortable with so that was a big transition mm -hmm. and we had to overcome that so it caused us and in the benefit of being in a network like this is seldom does one center have a problem like that mm -hmm. so we're able to collaborate and find out we talk about best practices well back during covid best practices were how are you handling the staff that have these child care needs providers too child care needs and uh, and then we talked through that and well we started a little couple of little daycares and things like that around the uh, centers so right. it worked out well and people stayed right when we talk about value-based care and in, in, in your platform which is you know as Matthew noted unique and different and, and as a healthcare consumer like value-based care is not generally how I think about it but we have to now talk about like upside and downside risk to providers, right? And and cost metrics that I suppose would be and associated quality metrics, quality right. metrics that would be associated with that. What Sims doing in that space? Are are providers doing that now? Or they are. You know, every provider, even providers in pri private practices, are kind of looking at that. They're they're looking at their revenue, um, you know, and the costs. So every mm -hmm. business does that. For us, we look at the value proper proposition for each patient, not from a dollars and cents, because some patients are worth more if you're in a, a for-profit world. Um, but, but how do we manage a patient so they, have, they get all of the care they need, so their health and wellness needs are met, so that they can be a less cost burden on an already challenged healthcare system so that we have time in our appointment schedules uh, to accommodate those complex cases, diabetics, hypertensives, uh, you know, our, our pregnant females and those uh, who have some post-mortem issues and stuff. And also what's grown is the, um, the patients who need some kind of uh, counseling and behavioral health or or some other 
level of mental assistance. Mm -hmm. And that can be draining when those were also patients that were being seen by primary care providers, the family medicine providers. It takes them about three times as long mm -hmm. to, to handle a patient like that than they do a patient who comes in for some follow-up care. So we looked at it and thought, okay, value-based is better. We have more patients than we can say grace over. We treat every patient who graces our doors exactly the same way, regardless of their means of payment. So we don't discriminate, if you will, or differentiate between a patient with insurance, without insurance, marketplace coverage, or anything else. They come in in the same uh, standards of care go to each patient, and most providers do this, but for us, our standing orders address it so nobody makes, nobody forgets to do anything. So every diabetic patient is treated the same way. And they're prepped and ready to go, and that has saved time for physicians already a valued commodity. I'm gonna also mention that the way we made it work the most, the, I think the most significant impact, was um, we had to look at the culture in the, in the organization. You know, and even now, I just I, I'm a healthcare administrator. It just kills me to see the culture in some of the the places uh, that treat the physician as though they were another another person on the um, you know on the treadmill. You know, the line moving the patients through, and instead of treating them as they should be treated. In my world, I, I may think I'm the best healthcare administrator east of the Pacific. And as good as I think I am, and every healthcare administrator out here, or anybody in an administrative role in the hospitals or anyplace else, they can't generate a dime of revenue in the healthcare delivery system. And no one can until, or no one does, until providers lay hands on patients. That's really what it's all about. And if their providers are a limited quantity, but patients are not, uh, we, we have, don't have enough providers to provide uh, the mix of patients to physicians that we would prefer, then we have to be smart in how we use it. So it became pre evident that we needed to maximize the potential of the providers and their performance. And the only way you could do it was um, not add, give them more patients or longer hours, but we had to give them more staff, perhaps. Right. We transitioned to electronic health records. Everybody did. Some providers are good at it. Some aren't. Uh, the providers are good. Uh, what do you do? We use scribes, and we can accommodate that. A scribe is uh, much less costly than having a provider fret over a computer, not able to maintain eye contact with the patient when he's conferring or she conferring with the patient. Instead, they're looking at a computer. So you miss things when you do that. That's what our providers say. So they don't want to do it. We don't want them to. Value-based uh, means that we want to get some, we want to share in the, um, the revenue that health plans enjoy. Uh, and at the same time, that allows us to have some additional funds to reinvest in ourselves which was very valuable during COVID right. uh, so that we could retain the providers we have so that we could have scribes for them or increase the number of staff support uh, folks that they have so that the patients can get all the care and, and that, that familiar um, comforting touch with the providers and their teams uh, that they need and, uh, and that we could afford it. When we do that, we collaborate with the plans, and what we learned was plans, health plans, are publicly traded for the most part. They have a responsibility to their shareholders. Um, and so they're looking at the cost to revenue, and we're looking at the cost to revenue, but from a little different perspective. We want it to be reasonable. We don't want the delta, you know, the, the when you're getting paid uh, a capitated rate and you know you try to keep your costs down that means you you aren't limit, excited limit, about delivering a lot right. of care to patients the care. you want to want that gap to be bigger uh, for us we know there's a gap there we want the plans to stay in business 
uh, but we don't want the gap to be that big. We want there to be cost. So the, the, the move to risk base is still, we're still on that journey because I think. We're in it, limited know, risk limit, limited right risk, now, right, right. full risk. If we, the, the only reason we're not doing anything in the full risk is we don't control what the companies do. Right. They and have they their are, own boards. They're right. their own entities. If we did that, then more providers would probably jump into a risk arrangement. Right. And that's too- but right now, those decisions could be made that we don't even have a say in. So, you know, getting into a risk arrangement with people that you don't have not just an equal voice, but at least a 50-50 voice in so that we could represent the provider side of this, uh, not a good deal. That's tough. But limited risk, yes. So let's pivot from some of the external factors to some of the uh, internal factors, some of the external factors. We know that the public health emergency designation is going to end in May of this year. What impact do you think that will have on the centers? And specifically, can you talk a little bit about the redetermination process for Medicaid eligibility and its potential impact on patients? First of all, impact on the centers, hardly any. There was some additional funding that was made available so that if you, your line of business was interrupted, and many of them were because we said we were asked by the state to do more, uh, more testing and, um, and uh, vaccinating or immunizing and all, and we did. Uh, because of all the mandates, we weren't able to use our facilities because if somebody came in, um, you know, and it was, and they were tested positive, then the facility was contaminated. Everybody was had to be let go, and not let go, but uh, couldn't couldn't engage in the treatment of the patients. So it's not much risk, yeah. and not much change. Um, redetermination is going to be a challenge, uh, and that's when the, the a Medicaid eligible person may be found to no longer be eligible. Is that right? Yeah, you know, you age up. The, the youth age up, you know, 17 plus years, they're no longer eligible. Right. Uh, and then for the, uh, you know, the, the females who were pregnant, you know, there was a limited period, you know, um, after the delivery, they'd be covered. But then after that, you know, they, they weren't. So, um, and then there were uh, also senior folks who uh, would age up and out. Um, it is going to be, it was beneficial. Uh, we got to see how many patients we could accommodate in our pr- Medicaid right. patients we could continue to accommodate in the practices. All providers did. Um, redetermination, there's so many ways they're talking about doing it. Um, it, it is going to be spread out over a period of time. It is going to start sometime in um, you know, around the April time frame. They're probably going to take these categories of patients that I mentioned out first Mm -hmm. because those are the ones that you would expect to go out. Um, And then they will come up with a proportional, uh, a number, a distribution over the course of a year, hopefully. Um, And some people are going to be allowed to remain on board. Now, the challenges we face, they're sending individual letters out. Uh, to each beneficiary, and those are if you've got a family of four children, all the children are going to get a separate letter. People have to go into a website, so you know bandwidth, the logistics computers, that's logistics. Be- how often is that going to happen? Can people do that without assistance? And so those are our concerns. We're working through that with DHHS. I think um, you know the director there, Robbie Kerr. He's been around the block. He knows what's going on, and I think uh, we'll all come up with something that's beneficial for the plans, for the providers, and certainly for the patients. Well, it sounded like at the last meeting I was at that the plans were trying to work with you and HHS to coordinate this to make it go as well as possible, which is a good sign. Yeah, you know, patients respond to us. They don't really respond to a call center someplace, you know, someone speaking some language. Right. Uh, But when a call comes from their doctor, or yeah. from our center's numbers, sure. uh, they know it's a friendly yeah, face. Yet another thing you get to do and not get paid for. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. But you do a good work, and I can't believe we've already been here 20 minutes yeah. and our, our time has run out. But um, Peter Levenis, CEO of Sims Trailblazer, just your team has a very good work ahead of them, behind them for the past 15 years. Happy anniversary. And ahead of them for, I hope, decades more. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. I really do appreciate it. And I can't thank uh, 
Matthew Roberts and the team at Nexon and Pruitt for all the help they've given us, advising and counseling when we need it at the most. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Glad to do Thank it. you. Well, Glad it's, to do it's it. been a blessing. It's been, a, been an honor. Yes. For those of you who joined us today, we hope you enjoyed this conversation, learned a little bit more about FQHCs and the good work that they do. We look forward to seeing you next time right here on Taking the Pulse, a healthcare and life sciences podcast.